Hello, welcome back. Okay, here we go. Video two in this series for the Triumph. We're going to do five videos in all on the Triumph. Just worked it through. We've got chain sprockets, which we've done already. That was a 50 minute video. What a humdinger. And we've got the rear brakes today. Front brakes will be next after that. Then we're going to do a full fluid service. Going to change the oil and filter and all the brake fluids because it is that time to do it. Come to that more in depth at the time and finally we're going to upgrade the rear shocks to something a little bit more exotic after all you know penny wants to stamp her own mark on the bike and turn it into something that is her interpretation of a custom bike that's what she wants which is why we went for a gold chain because as she says it looks pretty so there we are now before we get stuck into this it's a simple change all this is going to be of a rear brake disc and some rear brake pads with a little bit of insight along the way into the whys and wherefores where you might do it and some very important safety information when it comes to bolting a disc, a brake disc. Brakes are just about the most important thing on your motorcycle. There is nothing else in mechanical work on a motorcycle that is more important than the safety when you operate your brakes or you work on your brakes. So we're going to cover that so that you know exactly what you're doing. You're not going to cut any corners and you're going to get all the settings, torque settings and procedures correct. So when you do it to your bike, you don't make any mistakes, make yourself look silly or hurt yourself, more importantly. Right, so caliper here. Um, there's two bolts to mount the caliper to the carrier. When you take the wheel out, the carrier just drops free, but we're going to take the caliper off because we want to clean the caliper and push the pistons back and all sorts. going to put new pads in it today. So before we do that, obviously to take the pads out, you have to take the pad pins out. I think we've done this loads of times, haven't we? So if we're going to take the pad pins out, then while it's all still mounted, like I said, get yourself a decent quality and fresh Allen key. Get into those fasteners and undo them before you take the caliper off. Then you've got plenty of purchase. There's one and two, there we are. So we've just freed off the caliper pad pins. Pop a couple of turns on them as well. There we are. So when we come to undo them now, everything was held still by the caliper being mounted to the bike. It's just a sensible way to do it. And the same goes for torquing them up at the end. Simple as that. great way to push the pads back safely is to rotate the caliper so kind of do that with the caliper a little bit just like that and that will just push the pads back there we go you see that move a little bit there and it allows that caliper then drop free without scraping past the disc itself now they're virtually new because hang on 5,000 miles we're going to leave that now push that to one side there that's needing to do now we just take the wheel out Well, there we go. Four years of road use. Um, not winter use, not dirty, no salt. It's all still nicely moving. Everything's nice and free, but it's dirty. So let's give that a good clean up and see the new pads in it. So you saw that, pump them out so that it exposes the shiny metal like a gum line and then you know exactly how far the dirt goes to because we're putting new pads in which are thicker than these which means we have to push those pistons back further and if we do that the dirt that's on the end there gets dragged into the seals and that's just a downward spiral because it bungs them up, stops them moving and in the future it will cause them to leak and you have to rebuild your calipers. Long term consistent consideration of how you deal with your brakes will prevent you ever having to rebuild a caliper. If you get it early enough and when we bought this bike new then I consider that's early enough. Right, we're gonna clean and regrease all that stuff in a minute. 
but first, housekeeping. Old toothbrush, and in this is just straightforward soap. This, this is, it's not dishwashing liquid because as so many people point out to me, it contains a tiny bit of salt. This is uh, washing liquid for your clothes. So it's the stuff that goes in your washing machine and it's uh, free of everything. But it also, most importantly, it doesn't have any conditioner in it because that's silicon based and that will cause slipperiness on the brakes. So you want just basically soap. Don't also, if you can help it, oops, don't use um, car washing soap like turtle wax because that contains, well, wax. <laughs> Think these things through, boy. There we are, look, straight away. It just gets it all off. On the bottom one, literally wipes off. minimum standard that you should be aiming for absolutely mirror perfect if you've got corrosion on these then their days are numbered doesn't mean that straight away you have to replace them now but it does mean that in the future be conscious that once those pistons are pitted on the outside it's a downhill struggle you're always going to end up having to decorrode them clean them every time you do anything with them and to be honest, these pistons don't cost much. You can get these pistons from Wimoto brand new. Simple as that. Something else I wish I'd done, which I didn't, was the brake pins, because these, as you saw, clean them off, but they're magnetic, which means they're not stainless. Um, I guess I'm stupid, really. I should have got a pair of stainless pins for the sake of the six or seven pounds they cost. But the great thing is when the whole job's dressed up and assembled, these are nothing just to wind out and wind a new one in later on so i will be replacing these with stainless pins but for now i've just polished them so they're mirror finish absolutely lovely right reassembly now we've never so far as far as i know i've never covered this i've done loads and loads and loads of brake videos but not covered this slide now this slide carrier is what allows the caliper to center on the disc so when you, when you look at your caliper there's the disc there's the pads uh, they don't always sit perfectly equidistant like that so that when you chomp the pedal they grip either side at the same time. One will always hit first before the other and that will then drag the other one in and that momentary delay manifests itself in a, in a tiny bit of sponginess. It doesn't feel so instant. When you put a brake on and you feel that bonk, that whack as the, as the pads hit the disc, you're only going to feel that on a perfectly set up brake. The minute that brake gets a bit chewy and dusty, it's going to start feeling spongy, but it's not always air in the line. That's something I wanted to make the point on. People talk to me all the time about, should I bleed my brakes? They're getting a bit spongy. Clean them first, because it's a lot simpler and easier than bleeding fluid through. If the fluid isn't old and it's okay, uh, then you can probably look at the 
problems with the disc, uh, with the caliper and the dirt and the carrier first. So clean everything. Clean the old grease off those slides and inside these sockets, there's two rubbers on the outside there. And on those, if I can come up close, there's a little recess you can see at the end, just there and on that one as well. And that little ridge, these rubbers must pop over that ridge and grip the other side to seal. So what we're trying to do is we're going to grease these two pins now and then we're going to slide that back into its place. And what that does is that mounts it to the bike and it allows the caliper to slide side to side. If the caliper is not allowed to slide side to side freely and without resistance, then the brakes will be spongy. Simple as that. So keeping those greased and clean and moving is a, a great way to keep the brakes nice and crisp and fresh feeling. Now, what I put on these is this. Now, this is the stuff, if you remember from the last video, that they give you for the chain. It's high temperature white lithium grease. And I love using it on these because it doesn't melt. Um, the reason they use it on chains is that chains get hot, extremely hot. And if you don't believe they do, or if you've never heard that before, the next time you go for a hard ride, jump off and grab hold of your chain. You'll see what I mean. They're really hot, just a friction. And obviously, if it gets really hot, then the grease or whatever, if it's regular grease, I think I covered this a while ago in another video, regular grease will simply melt and flow out of the joint and it will leave the chain bone dry and that's no good. So this is a high temperature grease that won't melt. I'm going to smear it all over these pins. You can, in the absence of any of this, you can use copper slip because copper slip doesn't, doesn't melt either. But as I've got a bit of this left from the chain assembly, I'm going to use it up because I haven't got a tub at the moment. Again, consumables. I should have a tub of white lithium grease. It's stupid not to. It's a basic consumable. So must try harder. Problem child. <laughs> right, there we are. Grease them up. Right. And there we are. Just a light smear, it doesn't need much. You don't want to go picking up loads of dust and grit. Right, now the next thing is to push them back completely out of the way. If you've cleaned them properly, they should go back under hand pressure. And all I do is use a pad, which gives me even pressure, one of the old pads, pop it on the front of the two of them and just give them a squeeze. And they come back just fine. all the way back till they're flush. There we go. That's it. There we are. Pushed in all the way, as far as they can. No further need ski. Now next thing's a little spring. Pop this in and it just fits over the casting at the back. There we go. And that'll press down on the pads, holds them in position. Next thing, is a little frame. So they're all greased up, as we know. And as I said, the two little ridges, where are we? Focus. The two little ridges here at the base, they will locate in the rubbers here. These two little rubbers should pop over those if it all works correctly. So just pop them in and just find or in the hole. Now try not to fold these in completely and end up having to then fish them out with a seal pick. Just ease them in a little bit at a time, in and out, and you'll see that they go all the way in, right the way back. That's it. If you pull them out again every now and again, it will just bring the rubber boot back out so it doesn't fold in on itself and then press them all the way home and you should hear them pop over. And that is the kind of movement it should have. It should spring in and out on its own. There should be no resistance to that at all. And finally, now everything's ready, we can pop the pads in. Right. 
Now for this upgrade, I've decided to go for EVC double H centered pads. Um, loads of information. I did a whole video on centered pads on the old Triumph, so I don't really need to do it again. Just in, suffice to say, these are a harder material. They bite a lot harder. They give a lot more feel and feedback. I'm going to take a little bit of copper grease, just on the threads of the pins, nowhere else. And that will become clear the first time you ever try to get one out and it's sealed. Always put loads of copper grease on these pins because they will seize in there otherwise certainly down the line but I don't put anything on the pad pin itself because the job of this pin is to slide up and down the pad that's how it works so if you put loads of grease on this then any road salt or grit or even brake dust is going to clog up and make a stodgy covering and that's going to impede the movement of the pad so I leave the shiny part of it nice and dry and I just put a little bit of copper slip on the head so that when you screw it in it doesn't seize in place so the first pad is the little one the little one goes in the back press it against this spring you've got this little metal spring we put in here earlier just press the top of those two loops against it and that will snap into its little seat in there it's quite safe in there not going anywhere and the other one goes in that little loop on the edge goes on this bar at the bottom and then it just levers in like that upright. Now you'll have to press them in with your thumb. There's a little bit of jiggery poke here. Take your pin, pop the pin through. Now if you look down the hole yourself, I can't really show you this on the camera, look down the hole you can see the pads lining up. So just pop that in and there it is. In. So once that's down below that, so, uh, the edge of the caliper, that's ready to start screwing in. Same goes to the other one that in, press the pads with your thumb, that one went straight in, and we can just screw these in now, nicely copper slipped. There we are, one caliper ready to fit to the brand new disc, so I guess we better put that on the wheel. Right, so there we are, um, festival of different lubricants today. Just because I get nagged by you lot so much, that was lithium grease on the slide bars, copper slit on the threads of the pins, and red rubber grease on the pistons. Three lubricants for one job. However, you can put wet copper slit on all three of those if you are stuck and you have no other option. But all of these products, red rubber grease, copper slit, lithium grease, all these things are available you can buy them in your local car accessory store and many other places like it online a few clicks away no excuse right taking the disc off there you go move it about pop it on some bits of wood undo them in a star pattern so you release the pressure evenly just break them first they take them out. Right, disc bolts. That's what I've just taken out. Let's give you a look. There we are. These are stainless, 316 stainless, extremely good quality. They were five pounds each. All right, so don't chuck them away and do clean them up. As you can see on there, there's the remnants. Sorry. There we go. The remnants of the old thread lock, which I would have put on to hold them in. And that's got to be cleaned off. You can't use thread lock twice. When it's dry and scabby and old, it needs to be cleaned off, got rid of, and then you need to put some fresh stuff in. And that includes the hole in the rim as well. But these, as you can see by the little shoulder, they're very specialized. And they are only for that job. If you put regular bolts in with a disc, if you put a disc on with regular bolts then you risk in danger because it won't have this shoulder and if you are going to put a regular bolt in the disc presses on these threads and that will mush them and that will weaken the bolt and the rest is obvious so 
First thing is I'm going to clean these up, just see if they come up by hand. Yeah, there we go. I use blue thread lock in everything that I do, nice and removable, just a little white brush. And as these are really good quality bolts, there's absolutely no corrosion on them. I'm just going to clean them up so they're spangly spotless like that. Now, if you've got, if you take yours out and they're all corroded on the end and a bit scabby, chuck them away, get some new ones. Factor the money into the job. They are five pounds each around, probably I guess that's about six or seven dollars each and you might have twin discs on the front and that might be a lot of money, but honestly, is it worth the risk? Um, the other side of it as well is the peace of mind, isn't it? You know the score. So I'm gonna clean these up first and I'll show you what we do with the holes. All right, next thing, you've done the bolt heads, taken all that old thread lock off the bolt threads, got them clean. Next thing is just, just run a tap down into the hub itself, just to clean out those threads. So any little burrs in there that may cause the thread not to perform, just cleans them out and it takes all the old thread lock out as well all the old blue thread lock. You can feel there's a little bit of resistance to it, but it's not cutting metal, it's just taking all that nasty old thread lock out, because you don't need it in a way. There we go. Spacers. that's the things that space the wheel from the axle so it's centralized and all that when you put them in they go in and they sit let me show you close up on this there you go now a wheel spacer sits in there when it's doing its job and it rotates because it's held solidly by the axle that doesn't move when the bike's going along but the wheel rotates round so there is an interface between this rubber lip and this metal edge. So make sure that when you take your spacers out and you reassemble everything, put your wheel back in, that you roll around there, where are you, sorry, roll around there with your finger, make sure there are no sharp edges that are going to lacerate this seal and pop a little bit, if you will, of red rubber grease just around the outside, around the outside of that. And when you pop that in, it will not only keep the weather out, it will lubricate that against the rubber surface so that the seals won't wear, thus elongating the life of the consumable things. Because once the water gets through there, it gets to the wheel bearings, then that starts to knock the bearings out. And we all know how difficult and long-winded that job is. So there we are. When you put your spaces in, a little bit of grease around the outside, preferably rubber grease if you can, because it's rubber to metal, and that will keep them sliding and free as opposed to covered in cap and grease as they usually are when we stick them back in. Master of the sun, memories falling on concrete. Leaving no behind, now you swear to be my enemy. Victim of your cards, I'm running. And just a thin layer regular grease, regular engine grease or axle grease, call it what you want, just over the axle itself. It doesn't do anything because the axle doesn't spin against anything, the bearings do the spinning. But what it does is prevents it from corroding inside the spacer tubes so that when you do need to get it out in future, it just slips out easy. Master of the sun. Right, 
aligned the wheel. Now I've covered wheel alignment in so many videos, so I'm not going to make it a big song and dance. But I do want to say that I've heard a lot recently about people saying the marks on the back of the swinging arm, wherever you've got them on your bike, there are usually either chisel marks in the swing arm itself, or in this one you've got this stainless steel carrier that brings the wheel back and forward. It's a captive nut on the Triumphs. They're a very good piece of equipment and the wheel goes backwards and forwards depending on which way you turn it. These marks, let's just get this straight, these marks are accurate. They are accurate enough for what you need. So the perfect way to set wheel alignment is to measure the axle to the swing arm pivot on both sides. But doing that isn't always easy and in some bikes it's not even possible. Things like boot tourers that are covered in bodywork you just haven't got the time or the, the ability to do it without stripping off the bike. So these marks on the swinging arm are provided for your comfort and enjoyment. So enjoy them. You can set your rear wheel by those. Honestly, you can. Believe me, I've done it for many years. You can set a big straight edge along the bottom of the wheel, all sorts of things, and you will find that it still does work. So I would say, do trust the swing arm marks on your swing arm. Unless you've got a really cheap, Chinese 125, then I might say double check. And I mean they're not necessarily wrong, just double check because we know that those bikes are still developing in the level of their quality. But a Triumph, Harley Davidson, any of the Japanese bikes, I believe you can perfectly trust these. Remember, this is just a road bike, it's not a race bike. And I think the alignment that you'll get from using the marks on your swing arm is good enough, provided you take enough trouble to look at them and make sure that they are equidistant, that the notch up against the notch is absolutely the same both sides. So as I did in a video with this loads of times, check it, check it, and check it again. And then when you do it, you want some weight on the bike. So I'm gonna drop the bike off its little table lift and get some weight on this wheel before I, once I've aligned it, and then I'll set the tension exactly. But you know how to do that, so I'm gonna shut up and get on with it. I was told so many stories. I kept them in my stomach, lies the truth, fake smiles of blood money I lost cars at a loss for words, trying to keep my tone down, what I'm saying is absurd Unusual, context unique, buried in the depths of metaphorical speech, a hidden message Pull the info When you check wheel alignment on anything, or let me just get that right When you check chain tension on anything your chain tension must always be with some weight on the bike because the swing arm travels in an arc. I've said this loads of times, haven't I? So when I put some weight on the bike, I just use a couple of straps and a bar and I just pull the back of the bike down just a little bit to represent the rider's weight because the chain must be tensioned for when the rider's weight is on the bike riding along, not when it's parked up. So if you haven't got anybody to put weight on the back of your bike, because Penny Pitstop's not here, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Takes a drought to avoid all the secrets that I concealed. Hidden within the dust covered land behind the city, the street lights are dim, and the fog is always walking with me. It's nothing new, my eyes adjusted to the scene. Flickering on and off, it's just the daily routine. There we are. And you need an inch and a half, roughly, of up and down movement in the center of the chain, and that's measuring from the bottom. So if you're measuring from the bottom of the chain, it's an inch and a half up and down movement, not to the bottom to the top, but I've settled that, so you know that. There we are, inch and a half. Also, your brand new chain will bed in. So always ride 50, 60 miles, then check the tension again, just to make sure not only that it's bedding in, it's not become all of a sudden very slack or tight, but also that every nut and bolt you did up, is still did up. Sometimes what we see or touch might be rough or rigid. Like a wax painting a sound. This time I'm going to torque the wheel up. As I said in the last video, 85 newton meters. Do take the trouble to check. There we go. It's just as important not to do the wheel up too tight as it is to do it up tight enough. Do it up too tight, you can start crushing the wheel bearings and crushing the space of art inside and just doing damage. Just back that off a little bit, get the first click so I know where it is. Here we are, 85. 
and always undo your torque wrench because I know you nag at me over that. I do undo it, I just don't often show it, I edit it because it's not interesting. Always undo your torque wrench right the way off, all the way out so that all the tension is off it. That way you won't stretch the spring inside which measures the tension of things. Right, if he does it. Check the tank tension one more time. Once you've dropped everything down, put the weight, possibly even take it for a test ride. So, old marker paint. And then we take Penny's favorite, a bit of dragon's blood. Just put a little mark on there. And I always put a little mark just on the washer and the carrier. So the two marks line up there we go and if that moves you can see it straight away there we go excellent always pump the brakes out really is important now chain tension always check it again go for a ride come back check that chain tension once again make sure it's correct if it's a little too tight back it off because it won't be doing anything any good if a chain is too tight it's doing far more damage than if it's loose. A loose chain just flaps about and in extreme cases there's a chop opportunity it can jump a tooth. I mean extreme, extreme. But if it's too tight then it's pulling on this front sprocket. It's pulling so hard that the bearings in the gearbox are getting put under tremendous stress and pressure and that can do catastrophic damage to your output shaft bearing, which is not something you can do, because it's not something I would do. It's engine out, upside down, major engine strip. Don't even go there, just keep the chain, the correct tension. Next job is the front. We're gonna do the front disc, the same, the front caliper, the same, but also at the same time, we're gonna do a clutch cable, because I wanna do this. This is about making the bike that little bit more usable and user-friendly for Penny. She's got little hands, she's got little wrists, and I like that clutch to be nice and smooth. The clutch on these is nice and smooth, but I found that from Wimoto they do slinky glide cables. I'll show you a lot more about it at the time in the next video we do doing at weekend. You'll see that the slinky glide cables give it a smoother pull because they're a stainless cable that's coated rather than just a mild steel cable so they can't corrode, they last a lot longer and they give an easier clutch pull and that's all good isn't it? That's what we need with that clutch to be absolutely nothing so it gives you far more control in traffic. So slinky glide cable on the front disc and pads in the next video. I hope that's been cool so far. We've got three more to go. Thanks for watching. Ride safe. See you for the next one.